Well, a little confession to make this morning. When I, my first year at, as a camper, I, I didn't exactly always pay attention in theory class. I know that's probably shocking to many of you. In fact, I may have, may have possibly occasionally even slipped a note to a girl uh, in class. <laughs> so I feel better now that I've come clean. But um, to make up for that, I thought I would teach you a, a little music theory this morning. So um, I have this for you. Uh, this is a new way to play while you're here. Um, anti-socially and you do that by playing without taking a picture and uploading it to Facebook. <laughs> All right, some of you thought that was funny and some of you didn't. <laughs> How many of you uh, like to play pretend while you were growing up? Anybody? All right. Playing pretend is a fun part of growing up. The cool thing that I found out about being a dad is you get to play pretend again. So. It's cool because what happens is having a two-year-old lets you play pretend and not uh, have society think that you are weird or strange. So we pretend a lot and she loves to play pretend and uh, for lots of things. And you know, playing pretend is a normal part of growing up. Uh, that's what kids do. We, it's how our minds develop, it's how our imaginations develop. But this morning I want us to, to think about what happens when we play pretend in our Christian lives and in our spiritual walk. Because I think there's a tendency that we have at times to pretend to be something that we're not. To put on a facade and in some ways we end up living almost a double life. Our verse for the week, uh, of course, comes from Ephesians chapter 4. It's that verse that I really just want you to lock on to because there Paul reminds us that we have an incredible calling. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've been called by God and you have an incredible, incredible call on your life. And he begs us to lead a life that's worthy of that calling. And in order to do that, we have to see God for who he is, to see our lives the way he sees them. But one of the things that I've noticed in my own life and in the lives of others is that there are times in life, for whatever reason, we tend to lose sight of who God is and who we are in Christ. And when that happens, we tend to drift and we tend to not be as close to God as we used to be. We may start doing things that we really know we shouldn't be doing, but we're not really as convicted anymore because we don't have our eyes on God and we get sucked into a different life. And when we do that, a lot of times we tend to cover up and to conceal. So our word for the day is duplicity. So I knew some of you would like that. Abby, I think she likes that word. So <laughs> our word for the day is duplicity. It means deceitfulness or double dealing. And really it's a word that we could use of, of several people in the Bible. Remember Adam and Eve, they, they tried to be a little duplicitous. I think that's the right way to say it. They sinned and they tried to hide from God and they tried to pass off the excuses on one another and on Satan. David lived that way for a while, living a double life, pretending to be a godly king while hiding secret sin in his life. But there's another man in the Old Testament that I want us to look at this morning. His name will probably be familiar to most of you. His story somewhat familiar to you. Maybe very, maybe not so much. It's not a story that gets talked about a lot. And his name is Judah. And so if you have your Bible this morning, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 37, Genesis chapter 38. And we're going to look at Judah because from the life of Judah, I want us to see and learn the dangers of living a double life, the cost that it will bring, and how we can come clean. Now, to get us all on the same page this morning, I want us to just kind of step back and, and think about Judah and to think about um, his family. Of course, he is part of a very, very famous family, right? You have a man named Abraham that we're all familiar with. He has a son named Isaac, who has a son named Jacob. And Jacob has a large family. 
He has so with four different women, two wives, two concubines. Another story for another day. It was never God's plan. It was never God's design. And it always caused problems. But God uses imperfect people. Aren't you thankful for that? So Jacob has a large family. And he has a son that is his favorite. Who is the favorite son? Joseph. Joseph. All right. He was daddy's favorite, and Jacob made no, no attempt to hide the fact that Joseph was his favorite. And his mom was his favorite wife, so that's why the favoritism. And of course, this produced anger and, and frustration in the brothers, including Judah. And not only did Jacob play favorites, but Joseph really didn't help the situation much either, did he? Uh, remember, he liked to tattle on his brothers. How many of you know that that's just not cool, all right? All right. There's a code, right? We don't tell on our siblings because one day we'll need them to not tell on us. He also, you just got that. I think he's working on a delay this morning. I feel it too. So not only that, but then there was these dreams that Joseph began to have. And they involved basically his family bowing down and serving him. Well, of course, this didn't help anything. So you remember the story. Uh, Joseph's brothers are off tending the flocks, and Joseph is at home, and dad, who, you know, you know parents don't always get it right, and, and dad comes up with this great idea. Joseph, why don't you go check on your brothers? And Joseph's like, yes, I'll go check on them. Maybe I'll find them doing something they shouldn't be doing, and I'll come home and I'll tell you. And so he goes out, and... Most of you remember the story. The brothers see him coming and they're like, here's our chance. Let's kill him. Let's, let's just be done with this. Well, Reuben, the oldest, knows that that's not, not good. And so he says, let's not kill him. And he says, why don't we just throw him in a pit instead? And his plan, I know that sounds pretty bad, but his plan was actually to come back and rescue him. So they throw him in the pit and for whatever reason, Reuben goes off. Maybe he went to Subway or somewhere to get lunch. <laughs> I just want to see if you're awake. And while they're gone, Judah comes up with a better idea. He says, you know what? Killing our brother, you know, we wouldn't gain anything from that. And we might even end up feeling a little bit guilty. Maybe. <laughs> so he says, I've got an idea that will be profitable and we won't be guilty. We'll sell him. Real nice brother. And so the Ishmaelite traders come by, they sell Joseph, and he gets taken to Egypt. And, and we're familiar with that story. But I want us to kind of pick up now with the story of Judah and what goes on in the life of Judah. Because now they go home, and you remember they, they took Joseph's clothes and they tore them and they, they got some sheep's blood and they, they, they made them look like he'd been attacked. And they go home and they tell their dad that their, his favorite son is dead. And of course... Jacob is overcome with grief, as any parent would be. And for years, they keep up the lie. And for years, Judah and his brothers fake the grief. They allow their father to grieve. And he lives and begins to live this double life. Begins to live a lie. Begins to pretend he's something that he's not. And Judah will go on to continue to live that life, and we're going to pursue that a little bit this morning. So let's look at, at Genesis chapter 38 and, and verses 14 through 23. You see, Judah was somebody who mastered the skill of hiding his true self behind an honorable public facade. See, Judah was someone who knew how to portray an image, but not have the spiritual reality behind it. So look in Genesis 38, and we'll look at verse 14. Actually, let me back up. It says this. Well, let, actually, let me back up a little further. Let's, let's look back at the beginning of chapter 38. It says, now Judah's grown up, right? So Judah is, is a man. And it says, Judah left his brothers and he settled 
near the Ajumalite named Hira. And there he took a daughter of Canaanite named Shua and took her as his wife. They ended up having three kids. Ur, Onan, and Shelah. Now, how many of you, if you're awake enough to realize that by the time they got to the third kid, they did a pretty bad job with the naming thing. <laughs> All right. Sheila is just a terrible name for your son. Don't do that to your kid. All right. If you have a, a boy one day, do not name him Sheila. Really. Just don't do that. So Judah grows up. He has children. His oldest son, he arranges a marriage for him with a woman named Tamar. Now, guys, it doesn't work like that anymore. So when you go up, your dad is not going to arrange a marriage for you. You're going to have to go out and actually ask her yourself. All right? But that's coming later. You don't have to worry about that for a few years. So he arranges a marriage. Well, the Bible says that Ur was a wicked man and God killed him. So there was a custom that would take place in the society where a new relative was then responsible to take her as a wife and to have a child with her, and it would be the brother's heir. And that was designed to protect women in the society so that they would be taken care of and so that they could uh, be watched over. And so Onan, the second brother, marries Tamar. The Bible says that he was also wicked and refused to have a child for his brother, and God killed him. So Judah kind of backs up now and says, you know what? I don't want my third son to die. Well, it wasn't his Tamar's fault, but he blames it on her. So this is what he tells her. He tells her that, you know what, why don't you go back and live with your family? And when my Sheila's old enough to get married, I'll come get you. But he has no intention of ever following through. And so this is what happens. Chapter 38, verse 14. After a long time, Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua, died. When Judah, had finally, when Judah had finished mourning, he and his friend Hira, the Adjumalite, went up to Timnah to the sheep shears. And Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear sheep. Now, what you need to realize is the sheep shearing time, and you have to be careful how you say that in the morning because it's kind of a tongue twister and I haven't really had much coffee yet. This time was a time where wealthy sheep owners would get together and there would be shearing of sheep, there would be parties, there would be drinking, there would be lots of eating, lots of carrying on. You kind of get the picture. It was a time for wool, wine, and women. And so it says this. It says that while he was up there, that Tamar realizes that Jude is never, ever going to follow through with his responsibility to make sure that she is taken care of. And so she says, you know what? I'm going to put things in my own hands. So it says that after she was told this, verse 14, she took off her widow's clothes, veiled her face, covered herself, and sat at the entrance to Eniam, which is on the way to Timnah. For she saw that though Sheila had grown up, she had not been given to him as a wife. Verse 15, when Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. So this is where it's going to get really good, and if you're having a hard time staying awake, you might want to pay attention now, because this is where it kind of, the drama kind of comes in. So Judah is on his way down the road, and he sees a woman, and he thinks, I think she's a prostitute, and I think I would like to acquire her services. And so it says in verse 16 that he went over to her and he said, Come, let me sleep with you, for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. The plot is thickening. And so she said, What will you give me for sleeping with you? And he said, I will send you a young goat from my flock. Apparently that was the going rate. Well, of course, Judah doesn't have his goat with him. So she says, Only if you leave something with me until you send it. She's like, I, I've got to get some sort of confirmation. And he says, what should I give you? And she answered, your signet ring, your cord, and the staff in your hand. Now what's she asking for? She's asking for his ID. All right? The ring would have been something that was very personalized. It was used to stamp and seal his official correspondence. His staff would have been carved very ornately. And it would have been very distinguishable as his staff. So if you want to modernize it a little bit this morning, she's basically saying, I need your social security number and your driver's license. I'll hold on to those. 
And when you bring me the goat back, we will trade. And Judah says, yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> yeah. Men are not always smart. <laughs> In fact, sometimes they're rarely smart. So he gave them to her, verse 18. She got pregnant by him after he slept with her. She got up and left, removed her veil, and put her widow's clothes back on. Verse 20 says, When Judas sent the young goat by his friend, the Adumalite, in order to get back the items he had left with the woman, he could not find her. <laughs> he asked the men of the place, Where is the cult prostitute who is beside the road at Eniam? So, you know, he goes by the local coffee shop, wherever the guys are hanging out, using their Dunkin' Donuts, solving the world's problems. You ever see that group of guys in Dunkin' Donuts? Are you with me? <laughs> Some of you are there. <laughs> Some of you may be like, I, I go there, I do that. So he asked, he said, uh, you know, is there a prostitute that's been around? And they said, um, they said, um, there's no prostitute here. So the Adelite returned to Judah, saying, I could not find her. And furthermore, the men of the place said, there has been no cult prostitute here. And Judah replied, let her keep the items for herself, otherwise we will become a laughing stock. After all, I did send the young goat, but we couldn't find her. And so the story continues. We pass on three months as we come to verse 24. It says, after about three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law has been acting like a prostitute, and now she is pregnant. And what is Judah's response going to be? Verse 24. He says, bring her out and burn her. Judah's a nice guy, isn't he? <laughs> now think about this. You see... When we live a double life, a lot of times we compartmentalize our life. And I think Judah really thought at this moment, see, I was right about her. I was right not to give my son Sheila to her. Because look at her, she's immoral. And she deserves under the law to die for her immorality. And I bet you at this moment he feels really good about himself. Did you ever notice that you can make yourself feel better about yourself by comparing yourself to other people. Have you ever been convicted about some sin in your life but thought, you know what, my sin's not as bad as some of my friends' sins. And I think Judah's like, you know, my sin's not as bad as her sin. I bet you he felt very righteous and very justified in his actions. Even though this is the same guy who plotted to murder his brother, and then sold him as a slave, who lied to his father for years and let him live in bitter grief, the one who lied to Tamar, the one who slept with a prostitute, and yet he smugly calls for her death. Well, the time comes for her execution, and she just calmly waits. The day of her execution, she says, wait, uh, before we go on with this, she said, uh, see this uh, driver's license? This social security card, whoever ever these belong to, that's the father. And Judah's a well-known man. And in that moment, they're brought before Judah, and Judah's forced to come clean. And look at what happens. Verse 26. Judah admitted that they were his and said this, She is more in the right than I am even though she did something that was sinful. She is more in the right than I am because I did not keep my promise to let her marry my son, Sheila. What she did wasn't right or good, but Judas says, compared to what I've done, it was right. And I really believe in this moment, something begins to change in Judas' heart. For the first time, he's been caught and he's trapped and there's no way to wiggle out of it. Well, and Judah's life goes on. And eventually, you remember the story, there comes a famine. And Judah and his brothers are forced to go to the only place that has grain, which is Egypt, having no idea that the brother that they sold to the Ishmaelite traders wound up in the house of a man named Potiphar, thrown into prison for false accusations, left there and forgotten 
but one day remembered, interprets the king's dream and is appointed to become second in command of all of Egypt and to oversee the production of grain and the storage of the grain and the distribution of the grain for the famine. So Judah and his brothers go down and they have to go to ask for grain and lo and behold they come before their brother but they don't recognize him, they don't notice him because he looks Egyptian, he talks Egyptian. Remember the story, they have to ask for the grain and Joseph wants to, he realizes it's his brothers and he wants to find out you know, what's going on. He wants to know if his younger brother Benjamin's alive. He wants to know if their hearts have changed. He wants to know if his dad's alive. And so he takes them through a series of tests to see where they're at. Well, they buy some grain. They, they go back, but he says, you know, if you ever come back, you've got to bring Benjamin, who he was, they shared the same mom, Rachel. So Benjamin comes back with the brothers and at very much the protest of Daddy Jacob because he didn't want anything to happen to his son Benjamin. Well, Joseph rigs up a test. And Joseph rigs up this test so that he's going to frame Benjamin for stealing his silver cup. And he's going to say, look, I've got to keep Benjamin here as a slave because he stole my cup. So he sets him up, he frames him, he brings them back. And Judah had told his dad, look, I'll take care of Benjamin. Now, I want you to notice Judah's heart. Look at, if you have your Bible, flip over to Genesis 44. In verse 18, it says this, after Benjamin has been accused and they're going to leave him there as a slave, Judah steps forward, it says, verse 18, and he says, my Lord, let me say this one word to you. Be patient with me for a moment, for I know that you could have killed me in an instant as though you were Pharaoh himself. You asked us, my Lord, if we had a father or a brother. And we said, yes, we have a father, an old man, a child of his old age, his youngest son. His brother is dead. They're assuming that. And he alone is left of his mother's children. And his father loves him very much. And you said to us, bring him here so I can see him. But we said to you, my Lord, the boy cannot leave his father, for his father would die. But you told us you may not see me again unless your youngest brother is with you. So we returned to our father and told him what you said. And when he said, go back again and buy us a little food, we replied, we can't unless our youngest brothers go with us. We won't be allowed to see the man in charge of the grain unless our youngest brother is with us. So then my father said to us, you know that my wife had two sons and that one of them went away and was never returned, doubtless torn to pieces by some wild animal. And I've never seen him since. If you take away his brother from me too and any harm comes to him, you would bring my gray hair down to the grave in deep sorrow. And now, my Lord, I cannot go back to my father without the boy. This is Judah speaking. Our father's life is bound up in the boy's life. When he sees that the boy is not with us, our father will die. We will be responsible for bringing his gray hair, gray head down to the grave in sorrow. My Lord, I make a pledge to you, to my father. I made a pledge to my father that I would take care of the boy. I told him if I don't bring him back to you, I will bear the blame forever. So please, my Lord, let me stay here as a slave instead of the boy, and let the boy return with his brothers. For how can I return to my father if the boy is not with me? I cannot bear to see what this would do to him. Do you notice the difference in Judah's life? He actually cares about his dad. He actually cares about what he would go through. You see, for years, Judah lived a double life. He lived a life of duplicity. But in that moment, when he was exposed and he was caught by Tamar, something I believe very, very radical happened. I believe the grace of God began to intersect Judah's life and began to change him, began to reveal to him the way he had been living. And there's an amazing thing about Judah. Because today when we refer to our Savior, we refer to him as the Lion of the tribe of what? Of Judah. I know the tendency that we have as individuals sometimes to live a double life just like Judah. And I realize that for some of you, you may be living a double life. The person that you're here at camp is not the person you are at home. The person you're at home is not the person you're at at school. And trust me, I know all about this because I lived this way. When I was a teenager, when I was growing up, when I was in high school, before I came to camp, before God really began to work in my life, I was saved. I knew Jesus. I loved going to church. It wasn't an issue. I believed in God. I, I, I would listen to the messages and I thought, wow, that's good. That actually applies to me. I get that. But on Monday, you know what I did? I didn't do anything about it. 
And the way I treated people, the way I talked to people, the way I interacted with people was not Christ-like. It wasn't godly. It wasn't loving. It wasn't, uh, you know, I could go on and on. But nobody knew that at home and nobody knew that at church because I'd mastered the ability to live two different lives. And all of us have that tendency. And some of you may be living that way. And I want to challenge you this morning to come clean. I, I want to challenge you to deal with that sin that you're hiding and covering up. Because here's what it says, Proverbs 28, verse 3. People who cover over their sins will not prosper. When you live a double life, it will eat you up. It will destroy you, and it will keep you from fulfilling that call that God's placed on your life. That call that God's placed on you to serve Him, to walk worthy, to make a difference. People who cover their sins will not prosper. But listen, if they confess them and forsake them, they will receive mercy. You see, if you'll come clean, God is ready and waiting and willing to forgive you, to change you from the inside out, and to help you live differently, to help you live a life of honesty. And I want you to know that it might be painful to come clean, and it might take some, A, hard conversations with God, and some honesty with God, but also with others. But I want you to know that it's worth it. It's worth it coming clean. If you're going to walk worthy of God's call on your life, you can't live a double life. You'll never be able to live up to your calling. You have to come clean. And God's grace and His mercy, they await you. And God wants to change your life. And just because you've lived a double life and just because you've made mistakes doesn't mean that God won't use you. One of the greatest things that I struggled with when I felt God calling me to, to ministry when I was here at camp was I knew what kind of life I had lived. And I felt so unworthy. I felt so unlikely. I felt so ashamed. But I had to come to realize through a process that God's grace was sufficient to forgive my sin. And He wasn't calling me because I was worthy. He was calling me because He was worthy. And God's not finished with you just because you've made a mistake. He wants to use your life in a great way. As Judah's dad was dying... Genesis chapter 49, verse 8. He addresses his sons. And when it comes to bestowing the honor and the blessing on his sons, he passes over the first three and he goes to the fourth born, which is Judah. And this is what he says. Judah, your brothers will praise you. You will defeat your enemies. All your relatives will bow down before you. Judah is like a young lion that has finished eating his prey. Like a lion, he crouches down and lies down. Like a lioness, who will dare to rouse him? Verse 10. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from his descendants. He said, from you will descend kings, and from David on, the kings of Israel and from Judah were descendants of Judah. He said, nor will the ruler's staff from his descendants until the coming of the one to whom it belongs. This is a promise of the Messiah. And he basically is saying, Judah, from you, from your descendants, the Messiah will enter the world, that God has chosen you to be the one through whom your descendants will bring the Messiah into the world, the one whom all nations will obey. God will not only forgive you if you come clean, but He will give you fresh and new opportunities to live for Him and to serve Him. You're not and could not be in a better place to come clean than right here. Because you know what? You are surrounded by people who love you, who care about you, and will help you come clean. You might need to have a conversation with your counselor. Come talk to me. I'm around all day. A faculty member. There are tons of people around here who love you, who care about you, who will listen to you. And I promise, listen, if you come to us and you say, you know what, I've been living a double life. I've got some secrets. I've got some sin. There's some really disgusting things in my life. And I know they're not good. I know they're not pleasing to God. And I've been bothered by them, but I just didn't know what to do. I promise you, listen, we're not going to beat you up. We're not going to think you're a bad person. We understand. We know. We love you. We want to help you. You're no, there could be no better place to come clean than right here. And that when you leave this place, whether it's at the end of this week or in two weeks or four weeks, that you'll leave here different. And you'll leave here not living a double life. I'm so thankful. Did, did I live perfectly when I left camp? Absolutely not. But I began to live differently. When I went back to school that year, I didn't talk the way I used to talk. And I didn't treat people the way I used to treat them. Because God had changed my life. And this morning, I just want to invite you to come to the cross. To come to Jesus and realize He's going to forgive you. 
He's going to set you free. And he's going to give you opportunities to live for him and to serve him. The words of, of an old hymn say this. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to your cross I cling. Naked come to you for dress, helpless look to you for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. There's no sin that the blood of Jesus can't forgive. There's nothing that you're doing or have done that God won't forgive and show his mercy and his kindness to you if, if you'll come clean. And I want to promise you that though you might think it's going to be painful and uncomfortable, it will be absolutely worth it. You can't live a life for God and live a life of duplicity, a life of secret sin. Let me pray for you this morning. Would you bow your heads? Before I pray, and no one's looking around, but would you just, if you'd say just really honestly, I feel like in some ways I'm living a double life and I want to live differently. Would you just raise your hand? Don't look around. Would you just, just raise your hand so that I can pray for you? All right, thank you. I appreciate that courage. You can slip them down. I'll, I just want to pray for you. I don't think less of you. In fact, I, I admire your courage because I know how hard it is. It was very, very hard for me. But I want you to know that as hard as it might seem, the joy that comes from coming clean, the opportunities that will come to live for and serve God are far greater. Father, I, I just thank you this morning that you're a God of such radical grace and mercy. Father, I thank you that there's no limit to your grace, no limit to your mercy.